we should sort of like set the scene. You and I have been shooting these promos for days. It's like 11.30 at night. All the crew's gone home. And we thought, just let's just hang out like the collectors and fans would love this stuff. And let's just talk TV. And you and I are of about the same age. And we watch, watch the same shows and ate the same Pop-Tarts. We were, you know, both from the same can of cheese whiz. Rangel's brother. <laughs> so look. You know, I know what television meant to me. I'm happy to tell you all about it, but we're here for you. So I want to know, you know, were you like me? Did you have a TV in your bedroom? Were you allowed to watch? Who had that kind of money? TV in the bedroom? My TV my, was black and white. It was this big, but uh, it's where I saw Morgan and Mindy, The Love Oak, Fantasy Island, Six. Happy Days, Love yeah. Doc Cotter. Yeah. That's the stuff that raised me. I had my subscription to Dynamite Magazine. <laughs> I mean, that's, look. If anybody out there has a complete run of Dynamite Magazine, I would, like I would buy that in a heart. Like did you collect Wacky Packs? I did. What was your favorite series? For me, it was series one with the Big the Big Macs and the Captain Hunch. Remember that? Yeah, look, I'm, I'm a pop culture junkie, right? That's why yeah. I work here. TV raised you? Okay, so now I know we're on the same wavelength because uh, the TV characters that I watched, they were like my after school buddies. I was a little porker of a kid. <laughs> and I'd come home, and I would sit on the green linoleum floor on a little crappy black and white, and there I would hang out with Herman Munster and Keith Partridge and all these shows that I didn't even know were in syndication. Banana splits. Oh, oh don't start me on Saturday morning television. It's going to be an eight-hour interview. And to me, and the reason why I became so passionate about these pieces is TV was my whole childhood. That was my escape. I wasn't fat when I came home and watched TV. I didn't feel awkward when I was just hanging out with the Brady Bunch. And they didn't judge you. The TV characters we loved had the same problems we had. They had the same grievances that we had. They had the same parental problems that we had. I mean, it was kind of being... I did not relate to the Cleavers. I related to the Cunning. I think the reason why so many of us, like in the 70s, uh, were so closely connected to television is we kind of wished those families were our families. I can tell you in my house, when my dad came home, it was not a Mike Brady experience, you know? And, or I wish I had a personal manager like uh, Dave Kin Kincaid from the Partridge family. So I don't know about you, but I was like, oh, I wish I had that deal. What about you? Look, man, for me, you know, I had a great childhood. Parents, loving parents. I lived next door to the house that I was born and raised in. That's the weirdest thing about it me is that I can look next door every day and I can see sort of that living room where that zenith was and <laughs> I remember sitting in front of that TV this far from it as soon as mom and dad left the house every day every night the babysitter showed up and it was fantasy island on the, the you know the double bill fantasy island of love Park, where it was dialing in Saturday Night Live and mom and dad did not know that I was watching Saturday Night Live. What about all the family? Oh my god if they found out I was watching all the family they say every Saturday night when they left the house, kids have a great time listening to the babysitter. Don't let me find out you watched Fell in the Family. Really? So oh, that was, that that was, was a naughty. Year. Well, I was, I don't know, when it came out, I was like maybe 10 or 11. Yeah. And it was like, no, you couldn't. They were talking about, that was crazy time as far as TV broadcasting where you could turn the channel and, you know, the biggest problem was the mom, we broke moms of Oz. Right. Something like that to talk about wife swapping and abortion and, and race. Yeah, that was. Uh, we had our conversation about race in America. It really is true, right? You know, we took our we've always taken our cues from TV, and when TV gets it right, it's a reflection of what's going on in the world. But um, yeah, I think a lot of us were raised in one way or the other on television, with television, complemented by television. So. It sort of pisses me off that, you know, people think of the silver screen, you know, great movies and down here is the, you know, the, the idiot box. And so for really for decades until almost the eighties, it was like a disposable medium. Right. It didn't matter. Um, who but, would ever think that these shows would play again? But the weird thing is, it, right, movies were such, you had to go to them and you stared at them. You were supposed to be in awe of them. TV was in our living room, it was in our bedroom. I mean, I had a speaker that I would put under my ear. I would plug the TV into the one little white cable that had one little thing that would go my ear. Radio show. Yeah, so I would listen to it in my in bed at night so nobody else could hear it. I didn't even have to see it. All I did was have to hear it. I had to hear 
David Letterman or Johnny Carson or you. Tom Snyder or whoever else I was listening to late at night. Dick but, Cabot. Dick Cabot. But you know, look, I was walking through the warehouse the other day. There's more today. There's the Ewing mailbox. Every single thing that's in your auction, that's in this building, is something that triggers not just a memory, but a feeling, right? That's what television does in a way that no other medium could communicate. Everybody knows where they were when Elvis died, or we all know what we felt like when when uh, Jerry Ewing was shot. Especially up in here. <laughs> Dallas. So I think that uh, TV we, is kind of a timeline that we all hang our personal memories on. And I think like what you were saying, it's not just the TV shows, because if you watch some of them back, some of them don't age that well. But what we bring to it, the reason why you know these pieces that Heritage is offering are so valuable, there's so much competition for these pieces, is the shows were great at that period of time. Um, the objects are recognizable and exciting and, you know, visually exciting. But I think at the end, what people are buying are their own memories. And they're buying their memories of, I remember hanging out with my dad and watching David Letterman and talking. And I remember just, you know, sitting on the floor and watching Star Trek. And my mom was preparing the, the Swanson TV dinners. And you, had, you later we were going to have Jiffy Pop popcorn that made stovetop and all that stuff for better or for worse, is bundled in with the show. So I think that's the, the, the secret sauce of television. It's been a fascinating few days to spend with you on these sets. I mean, horrifying when you say fascinating. Well, I didn't want to say that. But it's been interesting to watch you and to watch everybody else's reactions to all of the sets. Like when people go stand where Norm used to sit, when they stand behind the bar, or when they look at and feel like they're in the bunkers living room. As someone who's spent a good part of their life caring for, collecting, preserving, serving these pieces, I can only imagine that this is not the easiest thing in the world for you to part with these pieces. Yeah, yeah, I, there is, uh, on the one hand, um, first of all, the uh, first statement, so blessed to have had this journey and to have as a job, you know, spending my days in Mayberry and Hooterville and Twilight Zone and living in TV and getting to meet these heroes and getting the honor of caring for these pieces. It, it has been so fabulous. Um, it, there is a bittersweet sort of peak in quality to this and that my goal since the early 90s was there should be a TV museum. There should be a museum dedicated to the most important, consumed, influential, and beloved medium of all storytelling, which is television. And I tried for well over 20 years to engage uh, the studios, networks, theme parks, casinos, cities, municipalities, and hey, let's, I have the stuff, I've done the heavy lifting, we have the stuff, I have the relationships, let's put some money towards building a TV museum. And unfortunately, in the last couple of years, uh, I came to the sad realization that it wasn't going to happen. It took uh, the Motion Picture Academy 110 years to get their shit together and open the museum. And if we're just speaking truthfully, the reason is it's very expensive to open a museum. To keep it going is very expensive and it doesn't make a lot of money. So to find somebody who's willing to say, let's just do the right thing because it's the right thing to do, it, it didn't happen. So. I was talking with my wife, Amber, and my longtime friend and publicist, Jeff Abraham, and I sort of looked at them and said, you know what, it's time that this stuff goes back to the fans. You know, I had this lofty idea, and maybe it would have happened. Okay, I'm not sad that it didn't happen. I'm frustrated. I don't quite understand it still, but I want these pieces to go back to the fans. You know, you never had to convince a fan of the importance of these TV shows. You never had to convince a fan of how it's an honor to own one pistol phaser or one genie bottle. They always treated these pieces with care and almost... Uh, reverence. Reverence. I mean, these are like, a, you know, Captain Kirk Tunic. Are you kidding me? That's like a, a religious shroud. Um, and to see something like that in a museum or in somebody's private home, they understand it. My friend uh, Warwick Stone, who started the Hard Rock Cafes and was their head curator, and when they'd have a piece like, say, a Jimi Hendrix guitar in a case, they would 
he would say in his beautiful English accent, that's a going to church piece, brother, because he could see that as people walked closer to that case with that one item, you know, whether it was a you know, Purple Rain guitar or, you know, uh, Janis Joplin tambourine, people started speaking quietly. It was like they were going to church. And this auction has, I don't know, hundreds of going to church pieces. I mean, whether it's Johnny Carson's set or the bar from Cheers or whether it's uh, Samantha's Witch's Council dress from Big Witch or whether it's... Batman and Robin's costume. Uh, and it goes on, you know, I had a meeting earlier today with your uh, cataloging department, right? And this is gonna be, by the time you guys see and hear this, you're gonna receive a gigantic, massive book that uh, sort of uh, walks you through the collection. And usually, you know, when you're in an auction scenario, you're like, okay, we have to find 10 pieces to highlight. These are gonna be on the back cover, the front cover, and the centerfold. And the problem we were having for two hours is how do we how do we find the top 50 pieces? I mean, and everybody at the table said, no, it's got to be the genie bottle. And somebody else would say, uh, no, it's got to be, you know, Maxwell Smart's phone. Or it, it, this sale is so filled with treasures. I mean, it's almost dizzying. And uh, yeah, I'm sad to see them go. But I would say in equal parts, I'm curious and excited to see who's going to carry on the journey, who's going to see to the continuous of these of these pieces, and let them bring joy and light into other people's lives, and just like television, maybe these pieces will live on. Well, I can't thank you enough for sharing them with us for these last few days. Certainly, like I said at the beginning of all this, I'm sitting inside a memory, that's something you simply cannot put a price on. So I thank you for that. I thank you for all this. Cheers.